the last couple of months, I've been just taking notes and writing down statements and so forth of the thinking about the last message that I will preach as the senior pastor of Calvary. And in the process of that, I was thinking, what if I knew I only had one message left to preach? What would I say? If I knew that uh, tomorrow that I was going to be in glory, what would be the last thing that I would want to say? And going through that thought process, I had a number of things, and I boiled it down to two thoughts that really go together. And I don't have the time this morning to take both thoughts, and so I'm going to take the one message I would preach into two messages because I don't have a couple hours this morning to do so. So uh, this is part one. Next week will be part two of the last message that uh, I would ever preach. Hebrews 9 is where I want to take my text. It might seem to be a strange text, but I think it'll, you'll see as I go along in this ninth chapter. The writer of the book of Hebrews is laying out the details of the Old Testament tabernacle and every Jew understood exactly what he was talking about, and, and he gives it kind of in a, in a brief synopsis for us in this ninth chapter of Hebrews. Verse 1 says, Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and earthly sanctuary, for a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. Behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. And of these things we cannot now speak in detail." And so he's, the writer is talking about this first covenant and, and the, the restrictions they had as far as worship and how they were to worship and all the regulations that were to be part of that. And it's a picture of things that were to come. So he says in verse 6, Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. So the, the author now is getting ready in this ninth chapter to, uh, to express what they did in the Old Testament. The tabernacle and eventually in, uh, when they came into the temple and their whole worship system. And he's going to compare them with what we have in Jesus Christ. And so he's laying the groundwork and, and the, uh, the priest has access into the outer tent, to the outer part of the temple then, the holy place in which he would offer uh, sacrifice. And, the, and the, uh, the Jewish person was not, the commoner was not allowed to go in, but this was the priest that would do so. Verse 7, but in the second part, the high priest went alone once a year and withheld blood, not without blood, which he had offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic of the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make, make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with the food and the drinks and the various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. So he talked about the high priest. Remember, the priest could go into the first part. The high priest could go into the second part. He would only do so once a year. It was called the holiest of holies. And there he would offer sacrifice through the blood for his sin as well as the sins of the people that they committed, as it says in verse 7. But it says in the Holy Spirit indicating that the way into the holy of holies was not not yet manifest. It was a picture of what was to take place, a picture of what was to be done. He said the high priest went in and the priest, they were concerned with the foods and the drinks and so forth, probably the ceremonial washing and the foods that they would, they would bring. Remember, this was a, a transition period of time. Now, as the writer starts to go into verse 11, he makes a transition and he brings to fulfillment really what, was, what he mentioned back in the 8th in the chapter in the 7th verse when he says, 
says, for if the first covenant had been faultless, there'd be no place to be sought for the second. If the first covenant would have been complete, if the sacrifices in the tabernacle and in the temple would have been complete, there was no need for a second. So he's, he's making a transition here as he talks about verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands that is not of this creation, not with the blood of, of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered into the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. When Christ entered the most holy place, remember he's picturing the high priest that went in, took the blood of the bulls and goats and offered it. He said Christ went into the most holy place and he offered his own blood rather than the blood of the animals. He offered his own blood. He demonstrated the superiority of his sacrifice as opposed to the sacrifices that were brought for the children of Israel. And the value of his sacrifice is really immeasurable to what could be compared to the animal sacrifice. Then verse 13. For if the blood, he explains it further, if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purity of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. In that verse 14, we again see the Trinity, the Spirit and the Son and God the Father. Now to illustrate the difference between the sacrifice of Christ and the ceremonial sacrifice under the law, he turns to the red heifer. Red heifer under the law, the Israelites, if they touched a dead body, uh, they, would have to, they would be ceremonially unclean. And so on the third and seventh day, they would take the ashes of the red heifer, and they'd mix it with, uh, with uh, fresh spring water, and they would anoint it to keep clean. History records nine red heifers, so they would last a long time. And we talk about the, the prophecy and so forth, and they look for a red heifer that will be used even in prophecy. But the, the superiority of the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ. So that if the cleansing of the animal sacrifice could do something outwardly, how much more could the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ take effect? And for this reason, verse 15, he is, Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. He's the go-between by means of death for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the internal inheritance. This is the promise that we have in Christ. God has called us. God has redeemed us. The sovereignty of God has saved us, and we have the promise of eternal, of our internal inheritance. Then he goes, in verse 22, he really brings it to a conclusion. And according to the law, Almost all things are purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in heaven should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. What Christ has done in, is better than what was done in the tabernacle and in the temple. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands just like the high priest did, he's referring back to, which are copies of the true. It was just an illustration, just a picture of the eternal. But in the heaven itself, where Christ appeared, the heaven itself, not now to appear in the presence of God for us. The high priest once a year would go in the Holy of Holies and sacrifice, offer the sacrifice. But Jesus, when he, and they would do so in the presence of God as the cherubim were representing upon uh, the Ark of the Covenant. But Jesus went into the presence of God himself for us. Not not that he should offer himself often. Not that Jesus does it once a year as the high priest entered the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for man once to die, after that, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly await for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. May God add the blessing to the reading of his word. Okay, pastor, what in the world does this mean to me? I want to speak this morning on the blood of Jesus Christ. If there's one message that I would have before I pass to eternity, I would want to emphasize the blood of Jesus Christ. Now there's some 
things that are true we need to understand before I get the heart of what I want to say. The sacrificial death of Jesus Christ was predetermined. We must never forget, never forget that the atoning death of Jesus Christ was planned in the eternal counsels of God from the beginning of time. It was no afterthought. It was no accident. It was no spare-of-the-moment idea that the Trinity concocted in the last minute because they were taken by surprise of man's sin. It was the divine unfolding of the plan of God that man would have the eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. Jesus was not a, a martyr. He was not a victim of circumstances. He was the executioner of his own execution. He was both the offering and the one bringing the offering. He was both the lamb and the priest. Acts chapter 2 verse 23 says, Having been delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken him by wicked hands and have crucified and put him to death. John 10, 18 says, no man, Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it again. This commandment I have received of my Father. So the death of Jesus Christ was predetermined. Second thing I want you to see is the sacrificial death of Jesus was prophesied. There are two ways it was prophesied. It was prophesied by word. You get into the scripture and there's a seed plot of prophecy throughout the Bible that emphasizes the importance of the, of the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was the seed of woman in Genesis in chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 53 gives us some insight to the power and the strength of, of the blood of Christ. It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our, for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. So Jesus Christ, was the sacrifice of Christ was prophesied by word. But it was also prophesied by type. Words cannot describe this morning the type and the pictures throughout the word in the Old Testament that pictures the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I see Jesus as the, in the slain animal, as, as the Adam slain, slew the animal and the skins covered the nakedness of Adam and Eve. The animal was slain and the blood dripped to the ground. They at first time had seen death. I see Jesus in Abel's lamb as the blood that was accepted by God. I see Jesus in the Ark of the Covenant. There the ark of Noah as the righteous judgment of God came upon the wickedness of fallen man. I see Jesus in the Passover lamb in the basin of blood that was taken over top the door and down the two sides. I see Jesus in the smitten rock and the brazen serpent. I see Jesus in the mercy seat of the Holy of Holies. I see Jesus in the Old Testament sacrifices throughout the Old Testament word of God. He is foreshadowed in persons. He's seen in the person of Joseph and Abraham and Isaac and David and Daniel. One of the greatest Passover pro uh, pictures and prophecies deals with the Passover lamb. The lamb that saved, by, as the Israelites would claim the blood and sprinkle it over the door. The lamb saved those that claimed that blood. In the lamb offered by Abel, we see a lamb offered for an individual. In the Passover lamb, we see a lamb for a family. In the lamb of Leviticus, we see a lamb that was slain for a nation. But in the lamb of God, we see a lamb that was slain for the world. In John chapter 1, verse 29, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. In 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanse us from all sin. What does it mean to us today? Let me give you four quick thoughts. Number one, the blood of Jesus Christ is precious to God and to his church. I think of 1 Peter in chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from the aimless, vain conduct received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It's precious because of its cleansing power, as Matt Chandler gave in the opening uh, video this morning. It's, it's precious because of its power, not only from past sin, not only from present sin, but the power of the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from future sin. You see, the devil has many great substitutes he wants to apply to keep us away from the blood. It might be works, it might be baptism, it might be church membership. He doesn't care as long as we shy away from the importance of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I just came across an article. Jerry sent me an article this morning, or this week, about a devotional by Alexander Begg in his daily devotional, Truth for Life. And he talks about the blood. Listen to what he says. Standing at the foot of the cross, we see his hands and feet inside, all distilling crimson streams of precious blood. It's precious because of, of, its, retaining, uh, of its redeeming and atoning effect. If, if by, it, by it, the sins of Christ's people are atoned for. They are redeemed from under the law. They are reconciled to God and made one in him. Christ's blood is also precious in its cleansing power. It cleanses from all sin. Though your sin be as scarlet, they should be as white as snow. Though through Jesus' blood, there is not one spot left upon any believer. No wrinkle, nor any such thing remains. O oh, precious blood that makes clean, removing the stain of our iniquity and permitting us to stand accepted in the beloved despite the many ways in which we've rebelled against God. The blood of Jesus Christ is also precious in his preserving power. We are safe from the destroying angel under the sprinkling blood. Remember, it's God seeing the blood that is the true reason for our being spared. Here is the comfort for us. When the eye of faith is dim, then God's eye is still the same. The blood of Christ is precious also in its sanctifying influence. The same blood that justifies by taking away sin also makes us alive. Then the new nature and leads us onward to subdue sin to obey the commands of God. There's no greater motive for holiness than streams from the veins of Jesus. And precious, unspeakable, precious is this blood because of its overpowering and overcoming power. It is written as they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. How could they do otherwise? He fights with the precious blood of Jesus, fights with a weapon that cannot know defeat, the blood of Jesus. Sin dies as its presence, death ceases to be death, heaven's gates are open, the blood of Jesus. We shall march on, conquering and to conquer, so long as we have power, the truth of its power. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all my sin. Second thing I want you to see, the blood of Jesus is hated by Satan and is opposed by modernists. Jesus is, is we find the trail of, of Jesus' blood in his redemptive power throughout all the Old Testament, as I've mentioned. Even Christians do not attach the importance to the blood of Jesus Christ that, that we ought to. I think of the example of Peter as he, as he made the marvelous statement at Caesarea Philippi and Jesus asked, who do men say that I am? And he said, I am. He said, some say you're Elijah and so forth, but he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And then in verse 21 of that same chapter, from the time that Jesus began to show his disciples they must go to Jerusalem, and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside, began to rebuke him. He rebuked Jesus saying, far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. For you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. Peter thought there could be some easier way, Lord. Some easier way. You don't, have to, you don't have to die that way. Some shortcut to salvation. There's no other way out of bondage in the freedom than by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Modernists hate the blood of Jesus. Many churches have eliminated it from their, from their songbooks. Anything to do with the blood of Christ. What we need today is believers to stand unashamed at the importance of the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. I remember hearing years ago a story told about a man named Sam Davis. He was a Confederate. He was captured behind enemy lines, but he had his Confederate uniform on. And they asked him if he would, if he would just tell them where his commanding officer was, they would let him go. If not, we'll try you and kill you as a traitor. He was not in a plain clothes. He was not in a traitor's uniform, but nonetheless, that's what they said. And Sam, they, they, they pleaded with him. Sam, Sam Davis made the statement. He said, if I had a thousand lives, I would give them all before I would betray a friend or disgrace a cause. We need Bible Christians that will be unashamed to stand for the truth of the power of the blood of Christ. Number three, the blood of Jesus Christ is God's complete answer to sin. See, the problem 
to sin has an answer, and the answer is the blood of Christ. It's not our good works. That all, the sin always hangs over us. Before Calvary, people were saved by looking forward to the cross. You and I are saved by looking backward. 1 Corinthians 1.18. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us that believe, it is the power of God. The blood alone can bring peace to the human heart. Colossians 1.20 And by him to reconcile all things to himself By him Whether things on earth or things in heaven Having made peace through the blood of the cross The blood of Jesus Christ is the difference between the world and eternal life It's the difference between life and death It's the difference between freedom and slavery It's the difference between fiery judgment and eternal bliss It's the difference between sin and salvation The blood of Jesus Christ takes away our sin It puts away our sin It judges our sin Hebrews 9, 26 But once now in the end of the world He has appeared to put away sin By the sacrifice of of himself the blood of Jesus Christ. What does God do with our sin? He blots our sin out in Isaiah 42. He puts them in the depths of the ocean, Micah 7. He removes them as far as the east is from the west, Psalm 103. He puts them behind his back in Isaiah 38. And then he says, I will remember them no more. You have sin and you go to God and your conscience beats you. And you've gone to God and you've confessed that sin and you've given it to him. And that conscience still beats you and you go the next day and you say, God, that sin is grieving me. It's heavy on my heart. And imagine the God of heaven looking over the brink and saying, what sin? I've removed it. I've forgotten it. I've chosen to blot it out. I will remember it no more. That's the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And then number four, the blood of Jesus is the theme of heaven's song. Revelation 5, 9, and 10, they sang a new song. Said that you are worthy to take the scroll and open the book. That was the, what many believe to be the title deed to the earth. You're worthy to take the scroll and open the seals for you were slain. Has redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. The theme of the ages is the blood of Jesus Christ. The heavenly chorus will sing forever about the power of the blood of the Lord Jesus. The power of the blood destroys Satan. In Revelation chapter 20, we just finished in one of our small groups a study of Revelation uh, by David Jeremiah. In Revelation chapter 20, there's a, a, a verse, a couple of verses beginning in verse 1. And I saw the angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil, Satan. You know, his terms, his names. He's saying that, that dragon, that old serpent, just so you know who I'm talking about, the devil, Satan, bound him for a thousand years, cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should not deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished but after that he's, he must be released a little while and then down to verse 10 now when the thousand years have expired Satan will be released from his prison he will go out to deceive the nations which in the four corners of the earth Gog and Magog to gather them to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea they went up on the breadth of the, of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints of the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them and the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever amen that's the power of the blood of Christ the power of the blood will defeat sin The power of the blood of Jesus Christ delivers the sinner. The power of the blood of Jesus Christ will defend the saint. The blood of Jesus Christ has never lost its power. You think about what Jesus did for us, dying upon that cross, giving us life, that you and I might be saved. January 13, 1982, an Air Florida Boeing 737 was flying Washington, D.C., I remember that because three weeks later I was in Washington for a conference and, and uh, we drove over the bridge right where the plane had gone down. It was fresh in my memory. 
It hit the 14th Street Bridge. We were up on the next bridge, and it crashed into the icy, icy water of the Potomac River. And 78 people lost their lives. Immediately, you, you, there were videos of this, and it was in news reports. There were six passengers that were floating in the icy Potomac River. The helicopter was over, hovering over, and, and the, uh, the, the inner tube was sent down, the, uh, the uh, life vest was sent down, and a man got it and gave it to somebody, and they were rescued. Came down, he took it the second time and gave it to somebody else. He did that the third, fourth, and fifth time, giving it to somebody else, and when they delivered the people to land and then came back that sixth time, the man was gone. He had drowned. He had given his life at that moment, that time he was nameless, since discovered who he was, but he had given his life for somebody else. In a far greater magnificent way, that is a picture of what Jesus Christ did for us as he gave his life that we might be free. He died upon the cross, he shed his blood, the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Can't explain it but it has power with God. There's an interesting passage, and I'll close with this in the book of Genesis. When Abraham was offering Isaac, and he was getting ready to sacrifice his son, God was seeing if he was going to be willing to do so. There was a ram that was caught in the thicket, and the angel of the Lord stayed the hand of Abraham, and he said this, for now I know that you fear God. The ram was to be then sacrificed. The ram spared Isaac, and the ram spared Abraham. But the ram was sacrificed for God. Because God then was appeased because of the offering of the blood of the ram. Jesus Christ died upon the cross, and he saves us. But the offering of Jesus Christ and the shedding of his blood was to appease the judgment of God upon each of us. Because the judgment of God would come. And God, how can a holy God take a sinful, wicked human race, individual men and women, and bring them into his sight and accept them? How could God in all of his holiness look upon the sinfulness of man? He cannot except through the sacrifice of the God-man, Jesus Christ. And God looks at us, and he sees us through the blood, those of us that have trusted him, and we're redeemed because of the precious blood of Christ. Do you know him today? Have you found the truth of the blood to be real in your heart today?